we begin once again with the words from the psalmist this day. Uh, may the prayer of the psalmist be our prayer this day as well. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. ironic today's topic is about anticipation <laughs> and preparation we're glad that you're here this day won't you please stand for our invocation and please remain standing for our opening hymn of praise mr. Don Rogers who serves as our deacon chairperson would you please come and lead us as we pray it teaches us patience too so let's join the in prayer please Heavenly Father Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Thank you for allowing us to come together, encouraging our hearts to come together, to worship and to praise and to sing, and to worship uh, as you would have us worship. Lord, just instruct our hearts today, feed us, guide and direct us, and we ask that you be with each member of the congregation and their distant families, Lord, that you be with each member of the church that's here today. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 282. Please turn in your hymnals and join in singing Living for Jesus.
welcome all of you as we gather here in the sanctuary at First Baptist Four Oaks. Uh, we also welcome all of those joining us by Facebook Live this morning. We're glad to be together uh, on this day of worship, this day of rest, and we're glad that you're here today. Please take a moment and look over the opportunities for the week. Just a couple of highlights. Uh, 12.30 today, uh, Jamie will be meeting with those that were not able to come to the youth ski meeting last week as they prepare themselves for their, the ski trip in just a couple of weeks. Also, on Tuesday at 11.30, uh, that should be actually a.m., 11.30 a.m., uh, we'll be having our uh, Young at Heart luncheon in the fellowship hall. Uh, the senior uh, social security boys, excuse me, Gene, I'm going to pronounce their name wrong. Uh, the Social Security Boys will be the entertainment for the day. Uh, if you're coming, we hope you'll come for lunch at 11.30 and be entertained by them. They usually do a very good job. Also, I'm sorry. Oh, also on Wednesday night, we'll be having our uh, Wednesday night activities. Uh, we did begin or have already begun uh, our Roman study. We hope you can come and join us for that. If you are going to come for the study on Wednesday night, we are reading through chapter 2, and we hope that you'll go ahead and read that and be prepared to discuss that on Wednesday. Just a quick uh, announcement for two other items. You'll see the red sheet of paper uh, in your bulletins this morning. This is for the fundraiser for next Sunday. Uh, this is our spaghetti luncheon to support the Blackfeet Nation mission trip. Uh, please tear off the bottom of that insert and put it in the offering plate. Or call us by Friday if you'd like to come. We uh, would love to know the numbers in being able to prepare for our food. Uh, also, you see a, an insert uh, referring to a fundraiser for our Relay for Life team. Uh, this is an egg ornament craft class on February the 1st. That is here at the church in the fellowship hall. And if you're interested in participating in this, uh, please let Marilyn Parker know by the end of January. They have to prepare uh, elements for that class. And I actually, Marilyn did actually have an, a sample of what you'll be making uh, that day. And if you're interested in making this, uh, please sign up. Just let Marilyn know that you would like to come and join us for that. One other announcement, uh, Melanie Autry's mother, Miss Repsy Johnson, uh, Miss Repsy has uh, attended several times here at the church, uh, health unfortunately keeps her away from joining us now. She's going to be having a, 90 a 90th birthday party uh, in our fellowship hall on February the 8th, and Melanie just wanted to share an open invitation for anybody that would just like to drop by. Uh, it's a come and go event, so you can just drop in for a few minutes between 1.30 and 5 o'clock again on February the 8th. It is good to be here today as we come to worship and as we uh, proclaim Christ as Lord this day. Won't you stand and welcome one another this morning? I got some bad news. 
I forgot to tell y'all that there was no children's moment this morning. So if you want to sit right there while I pray, you can. Or if you want to slide on back to your seats, you can. That is uh, my mistake, and I apologize for that. <laughs> y'all are wonderful and very diligent about doing that, and I'll try to do better next time, okay? It's good to have y'all up front, though. <laughs> Would you all please bow with me as we pray? Gracious Lord, we come to you this morning and realizing, Lord, sometimes we make mistakes. But you are a good and gracious God. And you are a God of second chances. Second chances that even when we try to run our own lives and we mess up and we turn to you, you reach out to us as we repent and you offer us your forgiveness. You are a good God, O oh Lord, because we realize the gods of the world are not so forgiving for they demand and they demand and they demand and when we're not able to fulfill those demands then they put us to death they destroy us why anyone would want to worship the gods of the world the idols of the world and not worship the living God perhaps we will never know the answer but Lord you let us come to you as a child comes to a parent. And here are the things, the needs, the requests that are on our hearts and our minds. And so today we lift up names to you, knowing that you're already aware of events and situations and personal needs, but giving you thanks that you hear our prayers. Today we remember Linda Johnson and Roy Turner. We remember Ricky Bird and Doug Lee. We remember Allison Beal. We remember all of those personal and private requests that we have upon our hearts and our minds that perhaps we've only shared with just a few people and we've shared with you. We have requests this morning not only for the individuals of our church, our families, and our community members, but we pray for the individuals that lead us as a county and as a state and as a nation. We pray for those in places of authority around the world, realizing that oftentimes the decisions they make impact us on a daily basis. Lord, we remember the leaders of our denominations that we affiliate with. We remember the missionaries who serve us this day, and especially those who are celebrating birthdays today. We remember all of those who work in your kingdom accomplishing your kingdom goals. We thank you for allowing us to come this morning, O oh Lord, and to offer all of these things up to you. And now as we share the prayer that our Lord, that our Lord taught us, may his prayer become our prayer this day. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Our offertory hymn is hymn number 607. Please take your hymnals and stand as we sing.
let us pray, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this special service where we recognize the Lord's suffer for Jesus Christ, who you sent to die for our sins. We pray for the uh, sick and afflicted in our congregation that we um, recognized earlier in the service. Pray that you'll be with them, be with their physicians. Pray that you'll bless these tithes and offerings, dear Lord. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. be reading from Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13. The parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were there and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So as a young Boy Scout, one of the first things I learned was the Scouts' motto, be prepared. Now, I'm not really sure if I wound up being a good Scout, but that motto, over the years, has kind of become my personal mantra, be prepared. You never really know when you need to be prepared because preparation never indicates the event for which you need to be prepared for, hence why you should be prepared. As a matter of fact, I've taken that motto of be prepared and evolved it a little bit through some of the wisdom of my forebears growing up in the foothills of North Carolina to include better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. 
or another element of reminding us that we need to be prepared. Two is one, and one is none. Interestingly enough, this element of wisdom has served me well over the years, and as I look back on it, I not only learned it in Scouts, not only learned it in the culture of the community in which I grew up, but I probably learned a lot of it from my mom and dad as well, especially my mother. Mom and dad were both children of the Depression era, and so everything they had, everything they achieved, everything they obtained, they took very good care of to the point that they would hold on to it forever and ever and ever. A story I tell every once in a while trying to get this point across, some of you all have heard before, but it's the fact that when I was a kid, my mother, every evening that we would eat dinner, when she went to put the items into the refrigerator, we didn't have the, the Ziploc baggies like we do now, uh, not really the Tupperware like we do now. We had more of an earthen crock kind of containers. But mom always had saran wrap laying around to put over top of those dishes. So the next evening when she went to the refrigerator, she would pull out that dish, perhaps reheat what she had used the night before, but not all of it, and place the saran wrap in the sink for when we finished eating and we were washing up the utensils and the glasses and the dishes, we also washed the saran wrap so we could use it over and over again. <laughs> Now when I was a kid in the 1970s, I'm pretty sure of this, that mom bought a, a piece of saran wrap or a container of saran wrap in the 1950s and we used it for 20 years. <laughs> that series of being prepared, of saving, of holding on to, of being good stewards of, has kind of served me for several years now, hopefully to my benefit and not to my detriment. That's why this parable that we've read in the Gospel of Matthew this morning is kind of bouncing off of my heart this day because it really is a story of preparation. It's a story of anticipation. It's a story of being ready. Now, I'm not advocating this morning about the idea of hoarding. That's not what I'm advocating. Uh, nor am I advocating what's popular in some cultural traditions of, uh, of prepper or prepping. That's really not what I'm advocating this morning. But when it comes to this parable that Jesus tells about the kingdom of God, I think that the earthly story of the bridegroom and the bride's maids also has spiritual connotations as well. And the spiritual connotations that Jesus tells in this parable I think has implications for us as a people of God gathered together in a local church, worshiping together and fellowshipping one together and studying scripture together, I think this parable really does have an impact on us as well. Now, of course, in the parable, we're told a story that's a little bit outside of our cultural traditions, especially regarding marriage and marriage ceremony and what all takes place. Uh, but suffice it to say, when the bridegroom arrives, there's going to be this big party, and it's the bridemaid's responsibilities to be ready to welcome the bridegroom for the party. They have a unique and particularly important part they play in this whole process. Not really knowing when the bridegroom is going to arrive. They begin preparing themselves to the point that They've waited so long that they all fall asleep. And then word comes that the bridegroom is about to arrive. They rouse up from their slumber and realize that five of them have enough oil to greet the bridegroom in the middle of the night. And five of them do not. 
in all of the excitement and all of the anticipation and all of the wonder of the process of this wedding party that's about to take place, five of them are prepared and five of them are not. The five that are not scramble around and trying to fill their lamps with oil. Uh, they try to barter with those that have been prepared and yet those that are prepared say no. With options running out, they make their way to the local store and they try to purchase oil and upon returning back to where the party is going to be held, find out that the bridegroom has already arrived the bridesmaids who were prepared have already entered the banquet hall and the party has already begun. Now when we read this story that Jesus tells here in Matthew 25, we realize that He has been telling parables about His coming again. But Jesus has been telling parables about the hearers of this word, his, his followers, to get ready to be prepared for His return. He tells a series of these stories, these, these parables, to make the point that this event is going to happen not set to a clock or a calendar on the wall, but to the desire of the Father in heaven. And the point of the parable simply seems to be we need to be prepared. In the same way that we read of the ten bridesmaids, five of them were ready and five of them were not, so too Jesus' point is we need to be ready. We need to be ready when Christ returns. We need to be ready when that day comes. We need to be ready when the kingdom of God, already broken out in the world and starting now, will come to its fruition, will come to its fullness when He appears again. We need to be ready. Now, interestingly enough, this parable runs in a different direction as well. Not only need we need to be ready spiritually, whether Jesus' return or uh, is future or it is some time close at hand, but also this preparation has to be at the heart of who we are as a people in the meantime. Remember last week's sermon and the focus of last week's text was found in Luke. And the farmer who wanted to build bigger and bigger barns because he had been blessed and the produce of his hard work continued to increase and he really didn't have any place to Put it. And so he told himself, Self, we need to build more barns because you've got more than you can use and you need to have it at hand. And remember, we talked a little bit about that parable, not so much being about anticipating the future and getting ready for the future, but about where the man's heart was. His heart was focused on himself. His heart was focused on what he had. His heart was focused in the wrong place. I guess in a way you could say that today's parable should be laid against the one that we read last week not telling us that we should not plan for the future, which is not what that parable was about. But that in planning for the future, we make sure that our hearts are in the right place. I guess you could put it this way, not building bigger barns to the God of self, 
but preparation of self to be used by God. The only God, the one God, the God of the universe revealed to us in Jesus Christ. That's why the story of the bridesmaids is of interest, I think. Because they were prepared to focus on the bridegroom and not focus on themselves. They were preparing to be used as part of the party, welcoming the bridegroom and not focus simply on making due for themselves. They were focusing on the wedding party and celebrating with the bridegroom and the bride and not so much focused on themselves. And the key part of it was they were preparing. They were prepared. Preparation comes as the third element, the third class, if you will, in living a life of generosity. The first element, the first class, was focused on compassion, realizing that we have been called to give, and we give, not because of something that is especially important or wonderful about us, but we are called to give and to share because we worship a compassionate God who has been compassionate towards us. Last week we realized that our contentment, our satisfaction is not found in the things that we have, but it's found in a relationship with God in Jesus Christ and that the things that we have can be used by God for God's glory. And the third class is the class of preparation. Preparing ourselves because we never, ever know when and what God will ask us to do. We never, ever know when God's direction and God's guidance may lead us to doing something that if we had not prepared, we would be unable to do. It reminds us that we store up, we get ready, we prepare not for the glorification of self or us or that we look good, even as a church, but that we prepare ourselves through pooling our resources so that as God leads us to accomplish His work and His kingdom in this place and around the world, we will be ready. We never know when God has been preparing us for something all along. And when His command comes, we should be ready to act. Just think about that in your own life. Spiritually, physically, through your education, through the work that you've done, through the sports that you've played or the instrument that you've learned to play. None of us, any of us, begin at the top of the heap. But instead, it takes little, small, incremental steps along the way, beginning at the very first step to get us ready for what we ultimately will accomplish or achieve. We don't go into the first grade learning the intricacies of physics. Or at least I did. Well, and I still have it, so that's a side. Point. 
We don't learn to play the beautiful music of a Mozart or a Beethoven the first time we sit down at a piano. We don't learn the plays that will lead to the achievement of scoring the basket or the goal or the run the first time we step onto the field of play. We do not accomplish everything God wants us to accomplish from the very first time that we say we will follow. But here's the thing. Every element of that journey, every element of that accomplishment is done in preparation for God, what God will call us to do. As we come together and brothers and sisters in Christ, as we share our spiritual gifts with one another, as we pool our resources together, as we come together for fellowship and worship, as we study God's Word one word at a time, one chapter at a time, one book at a time. I really think God prepares us for what God will call us to do. For He has shown Himself active in this congregation and in our lives together but always realizing that as we open up our hearts to Him, He continues to prepare us. So perhaps the motto of the Scouts that I learned long ago and many of you have learned along the way of being prepared is a pretty good word of wisdom. And especially as it relates to a life of generosity, a life filled with compassion and contentment and preparation for what God is doing and for what God will continue to do. In just a moment, as our choir stands to sing their anthem, We Remember You, I invite you to take the next few moments preparing yourself not only for the observance of this meal that we will celebrate today, but also pondering the very fact that at some point Christ will return. We will meet Him face to face, whether that's a, a future realization, something that happens soon, or whether as the man last week in last week's parable, his life was required of him at a time he did not plan for. What preparation are you making? What preparation are we making in order to be prepared?
Let me invite the deacons to please come forward as we prepare the table for the Lord's Supper. Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth these words from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Carol, would you lead us as we pray? Pray with me, Father God, we give thanks for this opportunity to come to your altar to remember Christ's sacrifice for us, for his body broken. We'd ask that you open our hearts and allow us to remember. We ask in thy holy name. Amen.
take and eat and remember.